Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Eugene. I use he, him pronouns. And I'm Thomas. I'll say he, him pronouns. And we are talking to you today about the week two of strike syllabus, which is the history of California bullshittery, underfunding public education, and the housing crisis. So in this week's kind of presentation and what we're going to be doing next week, we're going to be thinking a lot about tuition and kind of use that as a starting point for thinking about other structural issues in California and in the UCs. And so part of the reason is because it's why uh, education costs so much. But as grad students, a lot of times the value of our packages is configured by the, they'll say, you know, we're paying you this much as a stipend, but the value is in the tuition we're covering. And so the tuition payments are included in the value of our sort of package they give. And so I'm gonna talk a second for a second about tuition and then unpack it a little bit. So um, tuition free higher ed has recently been a political talking point in the US among politicians on the left. Sanders um, advocates for uh, tuition free higher ed and Warren um, has a kind of similar thing with debt free higher ed. These are very big talking points in presidential campaigns in recent years. But in the 19th century, the UC system was envisioned as a tuition free education for state residents. So it's not that new of an idea. Um, and it's been cited as inspiration for other public university systems. And this idea that the UC should be tuition free or it was tuition free was the case for most of the 20th century, as is evidenced in the 1960 California Master Plan for Education. All right, so this Master Plan for Education was put in place in 1960 by uh, Clark Kerr, who was the UC president then. Um, and there were like about six points to this master plan, which really coalesced in having a tuition free and broad access to education, where they did say you're responsible for your fees and auxiliary um, payments, but that the tuition itself would be free. And they created kind of our uh, use our California system of higher education. So the University of California, which is supposed to be the research institutions, um, where like the big the most advanced, I guess, um, idea of a higher education, California state universities, um, and then the community colleges. Uh, and part of this and why we have a lower division and upper division system is that there was a guaranteed transfer from community colleges to universities for bachelor's completion. So you could go to a community college and be guaranteed um, admittance to a UC later um, to do the upper division courses. And part of this was was keeping this 40% um, lower division, 60% upper division um, percentile that UCs have even today. Um, and the other part of that, this master plan was the Cal Grant program, which is just California student aid. Um, and part of this also developed the governing body. So like in the UCs, we have the Board of Regents um, and to put the people that make up that board and just for context, just go back really quickly to the point about fees. At this time period, um, fees per quarter for in for California residents was like seventy five dollars a quarter, and maybe I think one hundred twenty five for out of state people. So relatively small fees compared to what we're used to today. But yeah. since the nineteen sixties, um, state funding of public ed in California has de has decreased as tuition has skyrocketed. So today we're going to look at a couple of reasons why that is. Sort of related, sort of separate. Um, one reason is the Gipper. The governor, Ronald Reagan, um, in, who was governor from 1967 to 1975, one of his campaign promises was that he vowed to disinvest from public education, which he saw as a creeping form of socialism. And thus, shortly after being elected, he proposed a UC tuition, a 10% cut from state funding of higher ed, and he also fired Clark Kerr, who was behind the California Master Plan for Education. And one of the many kind of beautiful quotes he had about this matter was he thought the state should not in subsidize intellectual curiosity. This was very kind of novel that there should be tuition at the UC system at California universities and students protested these changes. So Reagan had a lot of strong things to say about protesters at this time, but one of the sort of more milquetoast things, um, he says student protesters were a small minority of beatniks, radicals, and filthy speech advocates. Um, he also, there was like, uh, I think suggestions there were secret orgies happening at Berkeley and things of that nature that he was all kind of aghast. So this is one reason that we see a decrease in funding of UCs and the sort of the beginning of higher tuition. But there's another thing going on this, around this time that also has contributed to the sort of current landscape of education and housing in California. And that has to do with Howard Jarvis Jr. and Prop 13. 
um, sort of now infamous, maybe famous um, proposition from the 1970s. So Howard Jarvis Jr. was a sort of thought of as a tax rebel from Utah who moved to California and he lobbied politicians in LA um, as well as in, con in a state Congress in Sacramento um, or assembly, I guess, um, lobbied them to restrict property taxes and taxes in general. And the kind of capstone of his achievement in this capacity was creating and campaigning for Prop 13, which was an annual property tax limit or it annually limited property taxes to 1% of the property's assessed value. And that value could only be increased by a max of 2% per year, and which is kind of like maybe convoluted. But whereas prior to this, property tax had been calculated by the value of the property in the year the tax was being assessed, he wanted to revert at this to the tax being assessed based on the value at time of purchase. And if that value increased a lot in one year, tax could only increase by 2% per year. Um, and this is sort of part of a larger kind of conversation about the value of home ownership and of a kind of suburban idea about property ownership. Jarvis was quoted as saying that the most important thing in this country is not the school system, police, or firefighters, um, the right to have property in this country, the right to a home in this country, that's what's important. So he was campaigning for this proposition and um, proposed it at a time during which property taxes were rising really quickly in California. So this is one of the things, a need it was seen to address. It was going to cut back on these really rapidly rising property taxes. But this is also a moment of sort of rising kind of xenophobic and racist sentiment among Californians as an influx of non-white communities started to sprout up. There was an idea that these property taxes were too high, but also going to social services such as schools and education that were going to be benefiting these communities non-white communities that white communities had a sort of issue with. Um, and so this drive to reduce the amount of tax collected by the California government is called the California Tax Revolution and kind of kicked off similar movements across the country in this period. So this had immediate effects, even though this was about property taxes, this actually had immediate impact on the way public education was funded. Um, so the year after it passed, California property tax revenue decreased by 60%, which is significant to education because property taxes had made up more than 50% of public school funding up to this point. So this has been a continuous problem, this kind of decrease in revenue, and it's resulted, of course, in the underfunding of California public education. One kind of startling graphic about the uh, number that illustrates this is that in 1965, California was fifth in spending per student in its public schools, and in 2017, it was ranked 43rd. So over the past 40 years, there's been a real dramatic decrease um, in California's rank as far as how much it spends per student. So to make up for this loss in property tax fund, California has employed regressive taxation, such as increased income and sales taxes that collect the most money from the people who are benefiting the least from Prop 13's um, tax cuts. Also another consequence of the tax revolution is that home ownership and affordable housing in California have become extremely difficult to come by um, because people who have bought property decades ago have no incentive to sell it because they're paying really low taxes. Um, these tax breaks for property are also applied to corporations such as Disney and Apple, which are paying very low property taxes on lands they've had here for a long time. Um, and it's incentivized real estate speculators to buy properties and flip them or buy them and rent them out. So it's made the housing market very competitive and very difficult to penetrate, or that's gross, to get into. Um, so now we're kind of looking at where does this history of cultural conservatism with Ronald Reagan and the home ownership and the focus on um, property rights and property ownership get us. Um, so Here's where we'll be talking about just California's continuing housing crisis. So since um, Prop 13, really, California has been experiencing extended and increasing housing shortage. Um, in 2018, California ranked 49th among the United States in housing units per resident. Um, so when thinking forward, California needs to double its current rate of housing production to keep up with expected population growth and prevent prices from further increasing. So that's just a baseline. Um, and then needs to quadruple that over the next seven years in order to, um, for prices and rents to decline in any way. So it's a huge amount that needs to happen just to get, to get any kind of change. Um, and after this, we'll kind of assess what some of those difficulties are. Um, so like in the Bay Area, seven times as many jobs have been created as housing units, and there's some reasons for that. Um, for every five new residents, one new housing unit was constructed, and the median price of California home was over two and a half times the median in the U.S., and I have some numbers later that 
talk show this um, from just this year. Um, and that houselessness per capita is the third highest in the nation in California. So we have a housing crisis. And there's a couple reasons for this. Um, Thomas, do you work on political economy very much? No. No, same. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to give you the, some like our basics of economics as we understand them. So there's a supply side and a demand side. And we're talking about supply side first. So uh, a big thing in California is NIMBYism. NIMBY stands for not in my backyard. And it is um, people uh, advocating and can, um, can kind of work to oppose any kind of housing and development. Um, and one of the ways they do this is um, to abuse environmental protection laws by landowner buildings. So in very wealthy communities, you'll see this often where, um, oh, I have some popping. Um, you can you see this these environmental laws which were originally protected or used to protect the environment and actually curtail development in very negative ways get used when wealthy location locales don't want any new housing because it will lower their property um, their property value um, there's also in California this type of suburban culture um, where as a whole it is very not into creating dense housing units so like New York City, let's say, which is just high rises. Um, it's very anti that. Um, zoning laws have been set up for single family homes uh, and not for like tall buildings. And there's also this culturally conservative history that is very into protecting land and the rights since Prop 13 and continues into the current moment. Um, the majority of people are willing to kind of vote against their interests to protect these land rights. Um, we can also see this like very real in the places we live, like at UC Santa Barbara, because we're in a coastal site, uh, buildings cannot be taller than like three stories. So you have gorgeous views, but you have people massively spread out. Um, construction costs are high here. It's expensive to get materials, but we also have a low supply of construction workers, especially since the 2008 recession. Uh, all the construction jobs were, um, got cut. And so those workers have left and haven't come back. Um, Remember that we're reducing the amount of properties available keeps housing costs high. So in order to privilege those people that have these expensive uh, land rights, um, they don't want to get make more properties. And as Thomas was talking about with Prop 13, you get greater tax revenue from commercial than retail development. So there is the um, there's the push to make more commercial hotel, um, etc. Development than actual residences. Prop 13. <laughs> On the demand side, um, there are incredible high housing needs. So some of the statistics we gave you before include displacing and gentrification um, with a, an increasing global demand. So like in the Bay Area, you see large amounts of um, international people moving for these tech, these tech jobs um, that are increasing increasingly need housing, people need a place to live. And it's pushing people, largely working class and middle class, um, to the margins of cities, of the state itself, and into other states to make way for these new residents. Um, the tech boom is creating these recent demands. So um, this year, looking at Zillow prices, um, in California, it's more than double. So 2.3 times um, that of the US. So you see here uh, in California, a medium income or a to price to own a home in the U.S. is 571000 or in California, and in the U.S. it's 247000 um, And a 2018 McKinsey Global Institute report estimates the housing shortage costs California economy between $143 and $233 billion per year. And that's in loss of construction work, lower consumption of consumer goods because no one can afford anything because they're spending so much on housing, and increased social services due to the financial burden of these housing costs. Um, and the UC itself is contributing to this crisis. So um, why, we, why we feel that this cold movement is really taken off at the university is that these universities are a product of this housing crisis and are, are contributing to it as well. Um, if we think about how education itself is, or public education and universities are built on land that was um, 
that was taken by indigenous people, especially in California, the history of genocide that has happened and the, and the land itself was often gifted, um, is a huge way of how universities were set up and continue to get profit from the displacement of indigenous people. Um, also displacement that occurs when the university builds new buildings and, and pushes people away for this ever expanding, ever changing group of students. And also that this group, this changing population doesn't have an investment in long-term housing prices. It's short term, it is always being turned over. So there's no people that are living there constantly except people that are working there that are affected by day-to-day -day housing costs. Um, it also, dis, um, this displacement dispor disproportionately affects Black and Latinx communities. And then next week, um, a big part of this is talking about profits and austerity, which we will be delving into next week so excitedly. Just a one more thing on that note. Universities, I have a link in one of these slides that I should post a picture of, but universities drive up the value of land and property in the area, which make housing which is affordable, even more difficult for university students who live there. There's a really useful chart that's again in one of the links um, that shows that in the state of California, University of California students pay a higher proportion of their income towards housing than students um, at other tiers of um, college in the state. Um, and so that's why through what we're talking about and what has been kind of discussed a lot of um, COLA things, as in that everyone in California needs a COLA. This isn't just for graduate students. It started that way, but um, it speaks to the needs of all Californians. Our undergraduate staff and faculty can't afford to live near where they, where they work and where they go to school. We see that from our students. We know staff members that have to commute long distances. Um, it, it does uniquely affect graduate students, but it affects a lot more people. Um, California is home to nearly half of the nation's unsheltered homeless population or houseless population um, and unaffordable housing and NIMBYism has hampered any solutions that we have been thought of. And so one example of that was recently a couple years ago um, in Oakland in a neighborhood that had a large um, home, uh, houseless population. Uh, there was a call to sort of create solutions or do something about the kind of homeless problem in the area. And so there's a proposition to build some um, kind of small housing in the area in an empty lot to house um, local unsheltered people. And the kind of nimbyist, the uh, nimbyism energy in that area said they don't actually want this, they want a solution to their homeless problem, but they don't want it to be built in their neighborhood. They didn't want that empty lot being used for this. So just one example of how these things can kind of intersect. Uh, and one further idea about this commuter society that is like, very prevalent in California is that it, cre it increases the amount of CO2 emissions and actually gets California away from any kind of emissions um, goals that they have because there is not enough public transportation. Cities were not developed with this public transportation in mind and it creates a lot of issues about the environment there. Uh, when we're talking about a COLA, the number we talk about is being rent burden, which is using 30% of your income, uh, your monthly income towards rent, and 50% is where you're severely rent burdened. And from California Budget Policy Center, more than 20% of Californians are severely rent burdened. So they're paying more than half of their income for housing. Um, and that is, unique, that is disproportionately affecting Black and Latinx um, communities. Um, who make up the majority of that number. Um, and yeah, and as we say, it costs too damn much to live here, and the state continues to serve the interests of wealthy landowners. So in as much we all need a call, as, as, in as much as Californians all need a COLA, the way that graduate students, the UC system have been pushing for that COLA is through protests and asking for literal kind of adjustment to how our fees are calculated. Um, but there are things that are sort of going on in communities in California right now that show some of the other movements or other kind of uh, energy that's out there, I guess. It's like still like Noreen Williamson. But um, just other efforts to kind of adjust the cost of living for people in California at large. So for instance, there are ballot measures curbing Prop 13. They're going to be on the ballot in November. Prop 13 has had a lot of support. It's like pulled on almost every year. Public Policy Institute pulls Californians on Prop 13 and its approval is always through the roof, even as people... Uh, realize it's caused a lot of problems for the state's education system. So the way they're trying to circumvent that in November is with a, pro a ballot measure that I've linked here, 
which would make corporations no longer able to benefit from that tax cap. They would be taxed based on the current value of the property, not on the purchase value. So that would increase the tax revenue the state could bring in. There's also talks about um, limiting Prop 13's tax caps to primary residences and not to like rental buildings or vacation homes. So voting on this and getting this to pass would be one way to sort of weaken the detrimental effects of Prop 13. Another kind of movement happening that is very much of our moment right now and also speaks to the ways in which those most affected by our housing crisis are sort of having to advocate for themselves the most is that COVID-19 um, creates health problems among the houseless um, in a number of ways, but even just sort of thinking about day to day, um, a lot of houseless people in LA and in other big cities access hygiene or care through places like Starbucks or retail stores where they can use the restrooms. And with things being on lockdown and shut down, they've had less access to even that. So the homeless problem that's always a health crisis in our state is especially exacerbated in this moment. Um, and to sort of address this, in, L in Los Angeles, people have started begun to occupy vacant, fake owned homes um, as a kind of as a testament to the fact that there should not be homeless people, period, but certainly not in a city where there is um, unused housing. Yeah. So this is all like a long way around of saying that the kind of rising tuition and expensive UC system that we are living in is very much the product and tied to the con sort of contemporary issue of housing and housing crisis, which has been in our state for years. So that's sort of one way of talking about tuition without actually talking about tuition. And next week, we're gonna do it a different way, um, blocking up profit, austerity, and worker suppression at the neoliberal university, specifically the UC, but to look at the ways in which cost and austerity and profit are really driving a lot of education costs in the UC system. Um, a big part of this um, talk, a big shout out to Jason Budge, who is a graduate student at UCSB in sociology, who is helpful for having, helping us think through some of these things. I'm not originally from California, um, and he was particularly interested in this because he think, he knows a lot of us are not from California or uh, and not aware of everything that has been happening with housing in California. And even people from California might not know the full extent of this. Um, I'm from California and I know nothing about Prop 13 until last week. So if that came across, <laughs> I apologize. But it's Absolutely. wild, it's done so much. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah, so um, that's what we have. Uh, we're happy to take any questions or clarifications or if people have like um, thoughts and feelings. Lila, would you like to share? Do I stop recording or? Um, I mean, I don't care, but. <laughs> okay. I mean, we can, uh, let's, I, I can stop the recording because I think we got everything we needed. So thanks.